November 19th, 2006, the day the Nintendo Wii was released in North America, and the day the gaming world changed forever. That was over 15 years ago. Oh my god. Reggie's body may have been ready, but oh man, I don't know if anyone else's was. The release of the Nintendo Wii started a brand new era for the company. The GameCube, it was a great system, now they're all looking back at it in retrospect, but at the time? Well, you find yourself in last place, it's probably time for a revamp, you know? Simple solution to that conundrum. Let the big dogs Microsoft and Sony go head to head in a horsepower measuring contest while we, at Nintendo, start appealing to parents and grandparents. Bold strategy, but it just might work. And it did work! Well, kinda. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure we're all caught up with what the Wii is, right? I mean, Nintendo put out a white box, it came with the TV remote-styled controller that you can play bowling with, and then it would go on to sell over 100 million units worldwide. One of the best-selling consoles ever made is obviously nothing to shrug at, but... Is it really that big of a deal, though? The Wii is in this weird place in history, no matter how much Mr. Reggie stated otherwise, a ton of those sales were from families that wanted Wii Fit, Wii Sports, Chicken Shoot, and that's about it. The narrative for the longest time was, nah, the Wii has nothing but shovelware, and only kids and old people play those. Us real gamers only play on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Yeah, you remember when Sony made, like, their own Nintendogs ripoff with their console, and then Microsoft said, Hey, you know what? Controllers are stupid, actually. Here's the Kinect instead. The console wars are dumb. I've said this sporadically throughout my video making career, but the Wii may be my favorite console of all time. If the large collection didn't make that obvious. It used to be such an embarrassing thing to admit while that casual-only narrative was all the rage, but you know what, man? 15 plus years later, nobody cares. I certainly don't care. The Wii is amazing. Nintendo officially unveiled the Wii at E3 2005 under the codename Revolution. We got a slick little black box here. There's a neat blue light around the disc slot. That's really cool. And not only did we see a logo that indicated the console would run Wii discs as well as these smaller GameCube discs, but the console was also somehow going to be able to run games from all the previous consoles too. A virtual console, if you will. The company may have been in last place at this point, but this was really the first time they were truly tapping into their legacy content, and that was really exciting. I mean, Iwata said that we'd be able to go back and play classics like Earthbound. You know, we wouldn't really get to that until eight years later on the following console, but hey, it was the thought that counted. And then they also unveiled these weird controllers and the console's new name was the Wii, huh? First, we want to thank everyone who wrote good things about it the day you heard it. Both of you. Ha ha ha, you're a funny man, Mr. Reggie. I gotta say though, for as confusing as the controller was, this initial showcase was killer. They packed in so many different potential ideas for the Wii Remote, it just sold so many people on it. Not just with the B-roll of players having more fun with video games than I ever have in my entire life before this, but with actual gameplay footage too. A Mario game, a Zelda game, a music game, the Wii did it all. This controller is real, and not only can you conduct an orchestra with it, but shoot down alien scum in Metroid too. That's crazy. Such, such a good trailer. And they were gonna sell the console with Wii Sports for less than half of the PlayStation 3's $599 two days after that console released to the public? Oh my god, it's no surprise this console took off that holiday season and for the years following. And of course, there's the We Would Like to Play commercials too. Iconic, absolutely iconic. I still go back and watch these every now and then because they just get me hyped for this era of gaming. It's so, so good. Still waiting on that green Wii to show up. Once it does, ooh, ooh, you'll all be sorry. But then, well, that's where things get a bit strange. That dumb narrative about the Wii being only for casual gamers? Well, it's not like Nintendo really did much to silence them. They would go an entire press conference at E3 with games appealing to the mainstream, showing a few PNGs of some mature games also releasing on the console that year, and then Reggie would go, what do you mean? Of course we care about the hardcore gamers. Man, for a few years, Nintendo at E3 was just them talking about how much money they were making and then showing off games that people barely cared about. It was a weird time. It didn't help that the console also couldn't put out anything higher than 480p for its resolution. Now, I understand the reasoning behind this. At the time, not everybody had an HD TV, and Nintendo was trying to work with the lowest common denominator, but man, the lack of power really didn't do them any favors that entire generation when any game dared to go multi-platform. The online infrastructure was terrible too, 
yeah, it was very laggy and, you know, sometimes you can get a good Mario Kart game going, but it was more often than not a total nightmare. But to be fair to the Wii's benefit, since it was such a different vibe than the other consoles, that casual stuff was actually really fun. I used to spend hours making Miis, checking out other people's creations and trying to get random celebrities to play sports with me. I used to spin the globe in the news channel a bunch rather than actually caring about the news. I would flex my free speech muscle with the Everybody Votes channel with questions like cats versus dogs. Very important debate right there. I would spend dozens of hours browsing the Wii Shop channel, hearing that fantastic theme song while doing so. I would regularly tune in to the weekly Nintendo Week show on the Nintendo channel. It was like this weird half sitcom, half early Nintendo Direct thing that was very cheesy, but also fairly entertaining. There was the internet channel, which you could also play Flash games on websites that were designed to have games you could play with the Wii Remote. That stuff was really, really cool. Oh, and all of the unique banners Wii games would have also. I loved these so much. Get a game that you're super hyped for, you pop it into the console, you've been waiting so long to play it, and that little banner is like the doorway that you still have to open before getting to that great game. Yeah, I know there were also a lot of bad games on this console, I get it, but listen, don't take this magic away from me. A major shout outs to Brawl's banner, by the way, for breaking the sound barrier, that was really impressive. I can't hear anymore? Now, one might assume that the dreaded Wii controller gimmicks were going to be the primary thing that prevented the possibility of, quote, hardcore games releasing on the console. And I get it, you know? A lot of people assume that playing the Wii is like this. But in reality, it's more like this. We're not out here doing cardio playing Donkey Kong, get over yourselves. And obviously, nobody understood how to best utilize this brand new controller setup than the company that made the thing, Nintendo. Man, Nintendo's lineup on this console, they weren't messing around here, there are so many great games. Introducing a brand new way to play games with Wii Sports, a series of games that almost everybody already knows how to play, made learning how this brand new console worked super seamless. And even to access the game in the first place, you use this fancy little sensor bar to point to the game on the channel menu with the TV remote looking controller? Oh, it's genius. Genius! As long as you weren't one of the people who threw your Wii remotes into the TV... And what I Oh, jeez! Then you were golden. And there goes the tennis racket. Come on now, the reckless Wii guy at the start of all of these Wii games has been trying to steer you all in the right direction since 2006. You should have listened to him. The virtual console feature was huge too. Downloading games directly to a console was a brand new thing back then. And clearly the shock and awe of such a thing was enough to justify selling NES Donkey Kong and Urban Champion for $5 each. Now, on one hand, that is awfully money-hungry, and I really don't condone that whatsoever, but, on the other hand, I did buy them at the time. So I'm part of the problem. This resurgence of retro game hype is one of my favorite things from this generation. All of these brand new next-gen games were releasing, gaming was hitting the mainstream in a way that we had never seen before, but dude, did you know there was another 16-bit console that was right alongside the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis called the TurboGrafx-16? Well here, here's Bonk's Adventure. Learn something new, kid. They would occasionally make a big deal of releasing some Japanese ROMs for purchase as well with a premium price tag. It's just a standard ROM that you didn't localize, why are you charging extra for this? Although I have to say, shout out to the N64 Virtual Console, still to this day, the best emulation Nintendo has ever provided for this console. It's a pretty sad state of affairs, all things considered, but hey, here we are. Also, do you remember when the Genesis version of Super Street Fighter 2 had Nintendo Wi-Fi connection support? But when you really take a step back and look at all of the proper games the company would release in the years following, it's honestly ridiculous. Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2, easily some of the best 3D platformers of all time. They made one of the best games in its genre, and then did it again. That's crazy. New Super Mario Bros. Wii, a really great 2D platformer before they started shoving the word new down our throats. Trust me, at the time, this was cool. And also, the discard is a big reference to the Super Famicom controller. That's pretty cool, there's your bit of trivia for the day. Metroid Prime 3 Corruption, an awesome follow-up that felt great with the Wii's pointer controls in my opinion. Metroid Other M on the other hand, I mean, yeah, not, not that great, but it's still interesting to talk about. Donkey Kong Country Returns, a phenomenal platformer that proved that Retro Studios could do a lot more than just first-person adventures. The Legend of Zelda, Twilight Princess, and Skyward Sword, two radically different approaches to the typical Zelda formula that, sure, now may have too much motion controls for their own good, and they are technically obsolete on the consoles they originally released on, but still, really good. 
Aw oh, man, Kirby's epic yarn brought the pink puffball back to consoles with an amazing art style, and then we had Return to Dreamland come out the following year with a more traditional style, both games fantastic if you didn't know my automatic bias. Kirby even got a better anniversary celebration with the Dream Collection than Super Mario All-Stars simply being reprinted on a disc. That really sucked. It was just there to reconfirm to you which Nintendo franchise is truly superior. Super Smash Bros. Brawl was easily one of the most hyped games of all time, especially thanks to the Smash Dojo. And sure, the gameplay is definitely dated compared to Ultimate, but this is still packed to the brim with content. And it is also the harbinger for the homebrew channel, but hey, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to that later. Mario Kart Wii, Mario Party 8, not Mario Party 9, I'm sorry, that's just my opinion. Mario Strikers Charged, Pokey Park 1 and 2, Super Paper Mario, Wario Land Shaken, Wario Wears Smooth Moves, and just a bunch of other games that really went under the radar. Battalion Wars 2, Big Brain Academy Wii Degree, Excite Truck, and more importantly, Excite Bots Trick Racing. The reboot of Punch Out, Rhythm Heaven Fever, Sin and Punishment got a sequel with Star Successor, which is one of the best action games of all time. Wii Play Motion, Wii Sports Resort, and even Wii Party are three genuinely great minigame collections, and I know everyone thinks the Wii series is just for casuals, but trust me, these games are really fun. Oh man, there's... There, there are so many titles! I really liked the new Play Control initiative too. That was a really fun venture. Yeah, the Wii could already play GameCube discs, I know, but what if we took a select few of the games and gave them native ports to the console while also adding some quality of life improvements and most importantly, Wii controls? What's that? We have the definitive way to play Pikmin 1 and 2 at a budget price? Donkey Kong Jungle Beat is fully playable without the DK bongos like a proper platformer? The first two Metroid Primes packaged with the third game for the Metroid Prime Trilogy, one of the best values Nintendo has ever produced? Really, just great stuff all around. Mario Power Tennis was pretty meh in that transition, in all honesty. And Chibi Robo never even got localized. I can't imagine why this series never took off. But for the cup of coffee New Play Control was around for, I think we got a few really good titles. It's just, in retrospect, it's a real shame that we never got more out of this. Sure, Wind Waker with motion controls, people probably would have hated it back then, and especially nowadays. But it still would have been neat. That's all I'm saying. Let's be real here. Nintendo did try to sell us on accessories too, like the Wii Zapper and the Wii Wheel. Yeah, you remember when they practically gave Link a gun and made a game around it? Oh, good. Good, good times. Actually, speaking of the Zapper, the Wii helped bring a handful of light gun games to consoles as well. There's the two Resident Evil Chronicles games, there's Dead Space Extraction, Ghost Squad. Not like you really needed the Zapper to play those, it was just plastic, but hey, whatever got more light gun games in people's hands, you know? Those are really, really fun. I did love when Nintendo was like, ah, yes, Mario Kart, it's compatible with the Wii Wheel. It's a hunk of plastic. Technically, it's compatible with every Wii game. Wii Motion Plus, that was a big deal too. Motion controls always like, it kinda worked in most games? For what it's worth in my opinion, the best part of the Wii Remote was the pointer controls, not the motion controls, but I digress. Once the Motion Plus add-on was introduced onto the scene, as well as the Wii Remote Plus proper, well, we did get Fling Smash out of it, so that's something. The couple of big games that used it did use it fairly well, but realistically, at the time, it was too little too late. Everybody had moved on. And especially now, in the world of super accurate controllers for VR setups? I mean, man, unless we get Fling Smash 2 or something like that in the near future, I think this battle is done. We did get some gorgeous Mario-themed controllers with this initiative, though, so... Oh, oh, oh man, these are good. Oh, and of course, what about the Vitality Sensor? Yeah, what about it, I guess? And sure, you go to a local Costco, you find a bunch of plastic that was meant to put your Wii Remote into, and there was just a bunch of stuff all over the place. None of it was particularly good, but they worked? I, I guess as intended? But no Wii accessory made a bigger impact than the balance board with Wii Fit. Oh, what, a video game about trying to lose weight? That's crazy! Yeah, you know, nowadays there are a ton of options to choose from, but this was easily the culmination of Nintendo's casual approach in this era. Of course, at the end of the day, nothing is really as effective as actually doing proper exercise or even playing Ring Fit at this point, but it definitely started to get a ton of people out of their seats and moving around a little bit. And hey, there are still a handful of proper minigames to play, and they're pretty fun too, so good stuff all around. This blending of casual appeal with proper proper original gameplay mechanics is one of my favorite parts of this era of Nintendo. Sadly, while a bunch of games would go on to use the balance board, aside from maybe Go Vacation and Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games, none of them were really all that enjoyable. 
Oh god, that's right. This is also the era where Mario and Sonic started working together for the first time. That is wild! Yeah, we didn't get the proper crossover that we all wanted, but I mean, the Winter and London Olympic Games are pretty good, so... Uh, you know, it could have been worse. Oh, and right, we did also get that full baby accessory. I don't- I don't want to talk about it. Operation Rainfall. Oh boy, what a time this was. You see, most of those heavy hitters from Nintendo for the Wii were released really early on, from late 2006 through 2010. As the years went on though, those releases started slowing down to a snail's pace, as Nintendo shifted development focus towards the 3DS and attempted to just let the Wii money flow in from people who didn't know any better. However, also at this time, there were three huge RPGs that Nintendo simply showed no public interest in localizing. The last story, Pandora's Tower, and Xenoblade Chronicles. You see, Xenoblade was initially going to get localized. At E3 2010, they did upload a trailer for a random game called Monado The Beginning of the World. Didn't show up in their press conference, but hey, here's a video for the internet. And then soon after, the company acted like the game didn't exist, and wouldn't mention it for a long time. God, I hate this company sometimes. Thus began Operation Rainfall, fueled by anger from the community to get those three big games localized at a time where Wii owners were starving for new content. There were a couple of games to play, Kirby's Return to Dreamland, Skyward Sword, but really all the games that people cared about were once again few and far between. There were emails, online petitions, people were bombarding the company's Facebook and Twitter accounts. They somehow managed to force the Amazon listing for Monado to number one on the pre-order charts, topping Ocarina of Time 3D. This was a really dedicated effort. Obviously, all three games did eventually release, two of them published by Xseed Games instead of Nintendo, and we will never truly know how much, if at all, Operation Rainfall played into things, but considering how common, more niche Japanese games release on everything nowadays, and how Xenoblade has blossomed into an amazing series with multiple titles and a ton of representation in Smash Bros, it is really fascinating remembering a time where people had to really fight for these games. And, while on the topic of Nintendo shenanigans, realistically, a bunch of their offerings did leave a lot to be desired. Animal Crossing City Folk felt more like a port of Wild World than a proper evolution of the series. Pokemon Battle Revolution is a pretty soulless battling simulator, lacking basically all of the charm of the Pokemon Stadium and especially the GameCube games that featured proper adventures. Donkey Kong Barrel Blast, Oh god. Games like Metroid Other M, Mario Party 9, Super Paper Mario, all titles that do have their fans for sure, but at the time, they were far too divisive, with negative effects still feeling relevant today. We music, I mean... Ah! It did not take long at all to feel like Nintendo was focusing on the new controllers first, and the actual games second. Because once Nintendo got their big ideas out of the way, the rest of their games either lacked polish or lacked proper marketing leading to pathetic sales. Dude, okay, Sin and Punishment Star Successor is one of the best action games ever made and like nobody played it. And oh, oh, that's incredibly depressing. But now I want to shine a light on some of the third party games that make this console library so special. You see, over the years, a lot of people will have you think that it's just shovelware from top to bottom. There are no good third party games whatsoever. Maybe you play a Nintendo made game here or there, and that's it. No. The people who say that are stupid. The thing is, at the time, the internet was starting to get a whole lot more robust, with gaming news sites keeping people in the loop. YouTube was starting to get a whole lot of traction, and as someone who was tuned into the system since day one, it became a lot harder for any quality games to go under my radar. Didn't really do Nintendo as a company any favors, but it certainly kept things exciting for me. It was weird, man. You would see Nintendo, like, talk about sales on stage one day and nothing else, but behind their words were sequels to Sin and Punishment and Wario Land and Punch-Out! Like, what? What are you doing? And also, a lot of multi-platform games of this generation, of course, missed the Wii, but in its place, there were so many unique experiences you could only find on the Wii. This basically means that the Wii is a treasure trove of hidden gems, as far as I'm concerned, and your only task is to sift through all of the Ninja Bread Mans and Anubis the Seconds and... Oh god. You see the joke with that last one? Is Anubis the First genuinely doesn't exist? Boy, that company. What a, what a bad set of games. Unless you really wanted an Elvis-themed platformer for some reason. Then if so, these are your guys. Watch out, Mario Kart. Eminem's Kart Racing is here to leave you idiots in the dust. <laughs> 
And let's be honest here, that fruit is way too low-hanging to be found interesting anymore. I get it, there's a ton of bad games on the console. Do you need me to go over that same topic? I don't think so. Hey, look at that. It's Calvin Tucker's Redneck Jamboree. Are you happy now? I'm not. It's not to say there were no big third-party games out there. We have the definitive version of Resident Evil 4 with simply divine pointer controls. That is still exclusive to the Wii. The original Epic Mickey was a huge deal at the time, and while that hype was definitely overblown, it's still a pretty decent 3D platformer. The same kind of goes for GoldenEye 007, which was really exciting at the time, but ultimately it was more so a Call of Duty clone than a proper return to GoldenEye. Still kind of a fun game though. No More Heroes, its sequel, House of the Dead Overkill, and Mad World gave the Wii a bit of a mature, bloody edge, while also providing some pretty satisfying motion controls on top of it. Sonic Colors was like the first universally praised Sonic game in forever, and it was exclusive to the Wii for 10 plus years. That's really cool. There was Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, an excellent arcade fighting game that is way more enjoyable than anybody expected it to be. Monster Hunter Tri brought the series to Nintendo for the very first time. Mega Man 9 and 10 may just be looked back on now as retro-styled games and that's it, but having a brand new title that looks and plays exactly like an NES game was incredible at the time. That was so, so cool. The big companies definitely supported the Wii. There is no doubt. Some companies even printed their games twice. You see, look at this. I got two versions of this Harvest Moon game, each with different disc art. Both of them official. Neat little pieces of the collection right here. And actually, the system was still getting games not that long ago. You remember when Just Dance 2020 released on the Wii and not the Wii U? <laughs> like, what? That that is genuinely hilarious. But actually, at the time of this video, the latest games to officially get a release on the Wii were the indie games Retro City Rampage DX and Shakedown Hawaii, getting physical releases in July of 2020. They're sold out now, so good luck getting them, but they exist. This website says so. So yeah, where the Wii gets a whole lot more interesting is in the games that didn't get the attention that they always deserved. And now I'm just gonna go through a bunch of them. You remember that cruddy launch title, Red Steel? Yeah, most people try not to. Ubisoft are the undeniable kings of overhyping their own stuff, and this weird mishmash of FPS with sword combat is a neat idea at first, since it was a launch title, so that was kinda cool, but it is not good. Red Steel 2, though? Oh man, not only do we get a great art style now, but a combat system that actually blends the gunplay and the swordplay in an incredibly fun way, and it's like the only decent third-party use of the Wii Motion Plus accessory. This game is the comeback story of a generation. Maramasa the Demon Blade, excellent side-scrolling hack-and-slash adventure with a beautiful hand-drawn style. De Blob 1 and 2 are great color-focused 3D platformers with the funkiest soundtracks ever conceived. Rayman Raving Rabbids may have been the thing that helped put our limbless hero in retirement for a while, but hey, we did get Rabbids Go Home out of it years later, a really fun and wacky adventure where you're rabbits in a shopping cart causing chaos in the real world and collecting junk to build a tower to the moon. Oh, it's, it's a great one. I know, I know the rabbits are annoying sometimes, but they randomly decided to make a good one here before going back to making dumb party games again. This one's good, I promise. Maybe you're wondering why Mario Golf never made it to the Wii, especially when Mario Tennis did. And while that does kind of suck, in actuality, Wii Love Golf was made by the same developers, and, you know, some motion control shenanigans aside, it's actually pretty fun. It feels like a proper Mario Golf game, just without, you know, the Mario part, which is why most people care about these games. Ah, oh, there's Deadly Creatures, a game where you do some platforming as a tarantula and close combat with finishing moves as a scorpion. It is so dumb and stupid, it's amazing. The Munchables tasks you with eating a bunch of rogue fruit, and at the end of a stage, the more you poop on your grandpa, the more points you get, or something. Who cares, man? The game is a lot of fun. If you're into 3D platformers with a great sense of scale, well, Mushroom Men The Spore Wars lets you jump around and slash enemies as a tiny little shroom in a big world. That's really cool. Dude, Little King Story. It's like this Pikmin clone, but the Pikmin have like a job system where you're building out your own little society and defeating these big, scary bosses with remixes of classical music playing in the background. Dude, it's it's so cool. Little King Story is so good. Elibits is what happens when you give a kid a gravity gun and allows you to throw everything, literally everything around like an absolute maniac in an attempt to capture these little sparkling things. It's fantastic. Dewey's Adventure, made by the same developers, is an obnoxiously adorable platformer where you play as a water droplet with the power to manipulate weather to get past obstacles by becoming a cloud or a chunk of ice. That's pretty fun. 
Fortune Street, Street, man. This one is technically third party, despite Mario being in it. This is a Square Enix title, and man, it is one of the best board game styled games ever made. Monopoly has nothing on this as far as I'm concerned, and considering the only Mario Party competition is 8 and 9, Fortune Street's better, I'll say it. Klonoa got a remake, A Boy and His Blob got a reboot, Sega revived Samba de Amigo, gave Knights a random sequel, Rodea the Sky Soldier is this really interesting case where it was sold as a Wii U game with a Wii version included, but the Wii game is actually a good one of the two, playing like a modern 3D Knights adventure while the Wii U version is like, Shockingly bad, it's really weird. It's a story in and of itself, but that's a fun one. Zack and Wiki Quest for Barbarossa's Treasure is an excellent point and click adventure game with a great cartoony art style, absolutely bonkers scenarios, and one of the finest uses of motion controls on the entire console to solve specific puzzles. Really good, I am still a member of the hashtag buy Zack and Wiki campaign. Fragile Dreams Farewell Ruins of the Moon is a great adventure, just oozing with charm and a really nice lonely atmosphere and tells an absolutely memorable story. And you know what? Let's go past the retail titles. Even the WiiWare service gave us some great hits too. Chick Chick Boom provides awesome multiplayer fun. Fluidity is another great use of motion controls where you tilt around the stage to move water. I love that one. Excitebike got a pseudo remake with World Rally. That was a really fun one. The Art Style series gave us a bunch of quirky little puzzle games with cool, dare I say, art styles. This is where the Bit Trip series debuted, a set of six awesome chiptune rhythm games with a modern retro art style, and it's also one of the couple digital Wii games that would go on to get a physical release with Bit Trip Complete. That's one to search out for. Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles My Life as a King is way better than it had any right to be considering WiiWare had a file size limit of 40 megabytes. How they got this whole game to fit into that, I have no idea. Muscle March. Oh yeah. I... I have wanted to do that for a long time. The Wii's library is ridiculous. Like I said before, obviously a lot of the big third-party games didn't make it on the console, but that's fine, because what we did get, the originality is off the charts. And I didn't even talk about all of it! Now, with a good portion of those games, games like Little King Story, Da Blob, No More Heroes, Xenoblade Chronicles, a lot of those games have gotten ported, re-released, remade over the years, and that's all fine and dandy, but I'm just saying. The Wii is still the only place you can play deadly creatures. And I'm only slightly upset about that. But, let's say hypothetically you've already played all of these games and you want something new and exciting. Well, I would be a fool to not mention this next part. One of my favorite parts about the Wii during its heyday was, of course... You, you, you knew I had to talk about this. Listen, alright, all I'm saying is there are multiple reasons why people were holding onto copies of Brawl all those years later, you know? Yes, modding a Wii was, and still is, a shockingly easy process, making emulation a breeze. And while I'm not about to be a big old advocate for piracy and stealing games, I will say the WiiWare service is no longer around, and while you can get some games on Steam or other consoles, so many titles that were released on that service are just unable to be purchased nowadays. And if you don't want to deal with PC emulation with Dolphin, I mean, hey, it's not impossible to play Contra and Castlevania Rebirth in this day and age, all right? You get it, you get it. If you are at all interested in the homebrew scene for the Wii, which is still fairly active, definitely check out WiiBrew.org, where people are still releasing software to this day. And for me, the most exciting bit of homebrew in the Wii scene, especially as of late, is the recent trend of fan translations for Japanese exclusives. Yeah, like I said before, with Operation Rainfall, some games did officially get localized, but now, thanks to some really dedicated fans, games like Captain Rainbow, Earthseeker, Fatal Frame 4, and Zengeki no Regen Leave are fully playable in English, and they are awesome. Hey, uh, d did you know that there's actually a Pokemon Mystery Dungeon game that's exclusive to the Japanese WiiWare service? Well, guess what? That is in English now, too. On top of that, a modded Wii lets you play games from other regions, so everyone in North America also owes it to themselves to check out Another Code R and Disaster Day of Crisis. The latter of which, by the way, was developed by Monolith Soft, the Xenoblade developers. That's... That, that is so cool! It's also surprisingly easy to get access to mods and hacks, like Newer, Super Mario Bros. Wii, fantastic platformer, and CTGP Revolution, a Mario Kart Wii mod that you can actually still connect online with thanks to fan-run servers. And, in fact, 
any Wii game can still be played online on real hardware thanks to the same service. Listen, I understand, you know, most people will only look back at the official offerings when looking back at a console's life. Makes total sense. But why would I lie to you and pretend like the homebrew scene wasn't a big deal for the system for me when I'm talking about my nostalgia? A lot of the same praise can apply to the advancements of that emulator, Dolphin. It is an incredible way to experience everything this console had to offer with hundreds of customization options and you can play online with games there as well. And to be totally truthful here, man, until Dokapon Kingdom gets a proper port while it's still hovering around $200 plus on eBay, this is your best chance to play it, so go and do that instead. The Wii is filled with nothing but shovelware and trash. I understand. I truly do. I have been a fan of this console since 2006. I have seen all of the internet discourse since then. I get it, you know? Though to be fair, I do kind of think a lot of the trash is part of the console's charm, you know? Like, I have all of these data design games, like Anubis II and Ninja Bread Man, only spend 99 cents on them. Oh, and then uh, Trixie and Toyland here? It's still sealed. Plan on uh, getting this graded one day. The legacy of the Nintendo Wii is all over the place, to say the least. While leaving the gate super strong and selling gangbusters for a little while, it became very evident early on that, despite what the company kept saying, the overall hype for the console was indeed a fad. Wii Sports, Wii Fit, maybe a Mario game here or there, that was really it for a lot of people. Some Nintendo games would of course sell better than others, but people like me, who played the system regularly and kept up with the new releases, we were few and far between, we were not going to keep the console alive. On top of that, the lack of pure horsepower and actually big third-party games caused the Wii to fizzle out only a few years into its existence, as Nintendo would go on to work on its follow-up console, the Wii U, and we all saw how that one went, didn't we? It is definitely me looking back at this era with rose-colored glasses. I'm not gonna lie, the late 2000s are some of my fondest memories ever, thanks to the Wii, and to be fair, the DS as well, so maybe I'm simply speaking from a place of total bias here, but whatever man, shut up, I like video games. So, whenever I say that the Wii is one of, if not my absolute favorite console, I hope this retrospective gives a bit more insight as to why. There were a lot of things holding this console back, and there are definitely better ways to play a lot of the console's library, but looking at what this console gave us during its prime, from 2006 to like mid-2011 or so, it's incredible. It's incredible. What can I say? I love this Wagglefest machine to death. Dude, even if you just emulate these games, I truly don't care. With how shoddy official emulation tends to be, and with how weird some of these business practices are, like Nintendo limiting the sales of Super Mario 3D All-Stars, go on ahead and download Dolphin and have a blast. I don't care. It is more important that these games get played rather than owned. That's my humble opinion on that, because once again, more people need to play Sin and Punishment Star Successor, and you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't. One last little nugget, you know that game Chicken Shoot, right? Everyone likes to make fun of it, rightfully so. But did you know that's not the only chicken shooting game on the Wii? There's actually a bunch of them, not even including all of the games in that genre for all of the other consoles out there. Why is this a series?